Hi guys, uh, Bob Greenier here, reporting from day three of the uh, 25th uh, Cold Nuclear Transportation and Ball Lightning Conference here in Sochi. It's actually day two of the presentations. So uh, again, another excellent day. There were uh, a couple of changes to the schedule. Um, unfortunately, uh, Kornilova couldn't be here to talk about uh, biological transportation. Again, that's a bit of a um, uh, sadness for me because I really wanted to, to meet her and, and discuss um, her progress in that over the last year or so. However, um, there was a new uh, person added to the um, uh, schedule and uh, he worked with uh, Mashinsky uh, and uh, he actually works at a uh, institute uh, he, I, I was led to believe that he is a, an extremely accomplished uh, nuclear scientist, theoretician, uh, and also an experimentalist. So one of these unique individuals, a bit like uh, Piantelli or you know other people that actually do their experiments and uh, have theory and, and work between the two. But he actually works for uh, you know a respected institution, and that's one of the things you notice here is that there are uh, people who, who uh, uh, you know. <laughs> not, uh, you know, how do I put this, um, put down because they're researching in this field uh, here in, in Russia, that they're actually um, out and proud, as it were. Anyway, uh, his name is Leonid uh, Arutskov, um, and uh, I will come on to speak to him about him in just a little while. But uh, starting the day, um, which was otherwise uh, pretty much to schedule, was uh, Klimov. And he talked uh, about his uh, reactors and added some extra detail. And uh, what he found was um, that he used an equivalent of an X123 uh, low energy uh, X-ray detector and uh, found that the um, uh, X-rays detected were in the the low uh, kilo electron volts, so that's sort of one to five, I think, kilo electron volts um, coming out of. Uh, uh, you know his uh, jet uh, in the sort of free space area. So actually, it goes through the jet in in the, in the glass or quartz or whatever it is, uh, or container, and then it, there's a little area where it comes out to free space. So he has uh, a nice mean free path, uh, uninterrupted to get to any form of detectors. The interesting thing is a normal Geiger counter didn't do anything. Uh, he did observe uh, when neutron detectors were very close, uh, uh, some uh, detection there. Uh, but I, I'm a little hazy on the details, and I have put out the Russian uh, for this uh, in, in the SoundCloud. Uh, and you can go and listen to that, those Russian speakers, and maybe uh, shed some detail on that. Um, and I will, uh, as soon as I can in the future, uh, possibly this weekend, if I can't get to it sooner, actually publish uh, his uh, presentation uh, video. Uh, but essentially what he was saying is the detected energy coming out from the, the, the bit of jet that's in free space, uh, the particles coming out, were uh, of a significantly higher energy, albeit the they're low killer electron volts, um, uh, significantly higher energy than the actual uh, uh, discharge voltage. Uh, so he seemed to think that was significant, and you can imagine why. Uh, and he said that they had a small fall-off distance. Now, I think he's trying to argue that in, in that case that um, the strange radiation, therefore, uh, doesn't actually have a long mean free path. However, however um, his system, I think, is quite successful because it's, it's constantly passing stuff through. Uh, uh, and so, it's, it, in my view, it's not able to build and cluster very, very, very big um, uh, charge clusters or... or um, in order that you would get very uh, intense strange radiation. And uh, my case that I would cite uh, for extremely intense strange radiation uh, would be the work of Leclerc, where, as far as I understand it, they were observing affected materials a long way away from uh, the reactor. So, uh, like I say, it, it looks like uh, if you don't run things too hard, and he, he um, has claimed, I, I believe, some fairly reasonable COPs. If you don't think run things too hard, the, the actual problem becomes more manageable. Um, however, it's still going to affect material in a short uh, uh, distance. 
uh, if it isn't, uh, for instance, uh, electromagnetically confined in some way, um, and, and uh, you know, over a long period of operation, uh, that could still uh, damage pretty much anything. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, the other thing that he noted was that um, the actual, it was anisotropic, it didn't come out and, and you know, I, I think I kind of indicated that when I, I showed you um, some uh, what I call spheres uh, in echo fuel where there seemed to be tracks coming away in a direction from those spheres. Well, he's observed that uh, the um, the emissions appear to be uh, from uh, in the gas dynamic direction. So the gas is going this way and, the, you know, there's a, a direction it's traveling. Uh, uh, I need more detail on that, but this is all uh, useful uh, information uh, as we start this journey to understand uh, this strange radiation. Uh, so um, uh, that's uh, a couple of things from uh, Klimov. Uh, Parkamov was chairing the day. Um, it was in Russian, so I, I wasn't really getting that. Um, but uh, for me, there was... Um, uh, a guy I spoke about yesterday from this private lab, uh, uh, he was also there. But I want, I want to go on to uh, Leonid uh, Orozkov. Um, and uh, he went through all... He had a very, very clear presentation. It was in, in English, the slides, but he spoke to it in Russian. Uh, he speaks good English, so I'm hoping to get some time with him. Uh, anyway, um, he uh, uh, went through, you know, basically why uh, low energy nuclear reactions have to be low uh, energy um, and I think he was saying that uh, essentially for there to be no radiation it has to occur below 100 kilo electron volts um, uh, otherwise you're going to get uh, uh, more standard nuclear reactions uh, which would cause uh, uh, radiation that everyone says you should observe but we don't um, in the standard radiation terms uh, he he says that you know uh, Heat uh, and excess heat is useful, but no one's going to believe it. Uh, but it, for the researcher, it's useful from a point of view to know where, whether you're actually getting something working. Uh, he said that more useful is uh, uh, elements uh, changes uh, uh, or elements that weren't in there to begin with. But of course, that's always criticised uh, because you know you can say it's from the environment or a chain of chain of custody contamination these kind of things are always brought up as, as reasons as to why that can't happen i agree um uh, so uh, he, he, he then went on to iso isotopic non-normal isotopic distributions and uh that i i agree is uh something that's much more uh, valid as uh, a potential uh, uh believable uh, signature of, of the occurrence of uh, low energy nuclear reactions uh, and then he also went on to strange radiation so <laughs> so his two killer arguments are strange radiation and um, uh, the uh, presence of non-natural isotopes I completely agree with Orozkov I wish I could say it really easily <laughs> um, uh, and so uh, he um, yeah, so uh, I hope to get that presentation out to you. Uh, at the end of that, um, uh, one of the couple of things he said that, that, that uh, there seems to be a favorability that uh, if the, uh, um, the atom is smaller uh, in mass, uh, it's more stable. And so there's a, a tendency to go in that direction. I agree with that. So uh, it, I agree with a lot of what he's saying. Um, and uh, after his presentation... Uh, I, I thought it was appropriate to talk to him about where my mind space was in terms of uh, uh, experiments and, and things that people could consider going forward. Uh, last year on uh, June the 9th at ASTI, I, I proposed, and we already had in the works, uh, the use of uh, 18 oxygen PN reaction to 18 fluorine with, a, I think it's 120 minute decay, uh, back. Uh, this is basically positron emission tomography uh, and we bought some 18 oxygen at great expense and we put it in reactor but you know unless you get the lenner working you're not going to see those PN reactions and maybe the PN reactions don't necessarily occur and then if they do occur well here's the real big problem that I've realized in, in that experiment. The system likes to make things non-reactive, radioactive. Uh, so uh, as soon as something that could be made uh, which is uh, 18 fluorine it would maybe instantaneously
be uh, made stable and so uh, that really doesn't look like it's going to work. The other problem is is that you can't get your detector close to the reactor whilst it's hot and by the time it's cooled down you know you might have had a couple of decays in there and 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 so in hindsight with where my headspace is at now in terms of uh, what's going on uh, in uh, Lena is that that probably isn't going to be a reliable method. So uh, I've been thinking over this uh, uh, last period uh, how I can um, leverage something that is similarly uh, uh, all over the world and well recognized as a, a means of detecting uh, a change in isotopes uh, that can be used in Lenner experiments uh, and uh, uh, that I would like to run some experiments on uh, in uh, the coming period. So um, I, I would actually like to run a, a series of experiments uh, next year using the Nova reactors. We have the supernova and we're still waiting for delivery for the basic Nova reactor. Now we already uh, appear uh, to have it working. Uh, uh, we didn't think it was working before, but there are characteristics in there that I will come on to that show that it has done the job in, in creating these sort of a uh, high crustal abundance uh, elements out of um, uh, carbon and oxygen and nitrogen uh, uh, from uh, sort of George Joshua reactions. But um, that again, as I said, and as uh, Leonid uh, made very clear, um, this isn't going to really convince everyone uh, or anyone uh, or that this isn't just contamination because it is high crustal abundance. It could be in dust. And, and, and so it's it's not really very helpful. So I thought, what, what is compatible with a, quite a few uh, Lenner experiments uh, that also uh, is going to be cheap and affordable uh, for the base materials, which, for instance, nickel-62 isn't and oxygen-18 simply isn't. These things are not cheap to use, deploy, they're kind of like one-hit wonders if you if you got the budget or, or you know something that's cheap and that there is tests everywhere. So I, I don't know why this didn't occur to me sooner. Yet it, it, it also addresses the problem uh, that I mentioned earlier, where you have this um, decay timeline, and if you don't capture it, you can't get close enough to it, or your equipment doesn't work. You've lost your opportunity to uh, observe this decay, and so. Uh, um, what you ideally want is something that's like fixed in the ash, a bit like the Mitsubishi and and uh, Technova um, replication, where you're uh, diffusing through calcium uh, oxide or whatever it is, and, and palladium, deuterated palladium, uh, with a, a layer, uh, a thin deposited layer of another element, and you're looking to see a permanent shift. So the ash it isn't decaying into something else; it's going to be left um, permanent. And this is going to sound really obvious to you when you actually hear it. And that is radiocarbon dating. Carbon-14 decays over, I think it's something like 36,000 years. And this method is used all over the world to determine, like, you know, how old, old dinosaur bones are and, and stratas in, in geological structures and, and how, how old, a, um, you know, a, a, a building section is or when someone, some, something, like, died or, you know, it, it's radiocarbon dating. And uh, <laughs> it couldn't be a better fit. Like, for instance, you know, look. Let's look at the carbon in um, the uh, echo fuel. So, uh, echo fuel add carbon, titanium, nickel, uh, uh, and uh, light water. Now, is the carbon a hundred thousand years old? Uh, it, 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 let's say we take some carbon. Uh, divide it into two samples. Uh, one, one for like the before, and one for the after. Run that in the um, sort of the uh, Nova reactor for a couple of minutes and then send it off to these testing centers and the testing centers are about $350 a hit uh, and ask them to test you know the before and after so that's $700 uh, uh, and uh, you know if if one says it was it, it's only you know last year's carbon and and the, the sample that's been run through your Lena reactor is I don't know 250,000 years old or something uh, we have a confirmation that Lena processes occurred and you're working with the understanding of Lena that Lena wants to nuclear remediate and and so this for me is one of the focuses uh, I'd like to see uh, the MFMP uh, look at uh, which is um, can we prove the uh, credentials of systems for nuclear remediation using very cheap carbon 
and uh, radiocarbon dating. So I'd like to run, I, I, I've got a, a forest house, I can, I can run this experiment in uh, uh, next year. Uh, I need to raise probably about $5,000. Uh, that, that would enable maybe three, three experiment cycles um, uh, uh, over, over a period of time. Uh, but uh, the answer at the end hopefully would be that you can use this relatively affordable system to remediate nuclear waste. Think about that. So uh, I, I explained that, but of course it's something everyone can use because there's always somewhere in each major country where you can do radiocarbon dating. Um, so the other thing I just want to talk about before I go down and grab a bit to eat is that, uh, you know, what I like about the presentations here, there's enough time for people to do Q&A and discussion. Uh, obviously, they try and stop it, but that might be because there's been some schedule changes. But um, uh, they're really prepared to challenge and allow challenges to be discussed and not just discussed between the speaker and, and the person challenging uh, things, also between uh, different people in the room. And they all seem to know enough uh, to be able to discuss around it. So that, that's that's something that's really interested, uh, interesting. Um, and uh, then I just want to, the last point I want to make is, uh, there was a guy that I mentioned yesterday uh, uh, who stopped their research because uh, of the... Of the um, uh, risks of strange radiation but he, he talked about some other research and gave some more detail and he's from the uh private lab uh, in Elias in Moscow and I think the guy was V Zeta Zeta Lepin um yeah V Zeta Lepin uh anyway uh he's a great guy uh he talked about this um bismuth uh bullet that uh, uh you know shot from like a, a gun so you're, you're replacing the lead or, or whatever it is uh, from the um uh, head of the bullet with a, a cast uh, bismuth bullet and it goes down the rifling and it gets spun up and he shot that through into a system where it me measures the energy now, now two things yesterday i talked about the fact that um, when when this actually collides with the target it actually creates strange radiation. And I think it's um, Shishkin's group, and I'm really looking forward to their presentation later in the week. Uh, and I've met him, he is here, uh, so uh, we will get that. Um, they're creating what looks like strange radiation by a high velocity spinning of um, uh, uh, metal samples, or various samples, in fact. And uh, so it, it, it maybe the, the spinning action, obviously uh, bismuth has this uh, it's, the, it's the heaviest kind of stable element, is basically stable, and uh, it's got this uh, incredible magnetic property, um, uh, or n n opposite of magnetic property, anyway, go and look at that. Um, so it, it's quite a unique uh, element, uh, and um, uh, the thing was, is it wasn't just that it creates strange radiation um, that after it's impacted, it also had a COP of two. So what he's saying is the energy of the impact uh, was twice that chemical energy put in. Uh, so, you know, I would um, have a problem with this uh, if there wasn't the strange radiation. So th there's two really interesting things going on. So th this is a quite interesting way to make strange radiation. Not just, you, you know, um, maybe a lot of American households have some bullets and, you know, maybe some people have, uh, I'm not going to encourage this, but... Uh, um, uh, cast their own metals uh, for tips and uh, you can cast uh, uh, bismuth it's a bit weird because when it's in the solid state it's a bit bigger so you have to think about that um, and uh, you know tr try this experiment um, it uh, could be for those that are, that, that are in a position to do so a relatively affordable way of creating uh, strange radiation so that was really fascinating. And the last thing that he discussed um, was uh, that they took an insulator and they had a, a mass balance and they spun the insulator with a motor at extremely high speed. Uh, and guess what? When it went in one direction, uh, the mass balance recorded an increase in weight. And when it, in the, when it went in the other direction, this is a, 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 an insulator. It was actually a disc made of beeswax. Uh, when it went in the other direction, uh, it, it, it recorded a um, decrease in weight. So an increase in weight one direction, a decrease in weight. And of course, you know, is that anti-gravity or is that propulsion?
Okay, so uh, we're going to have a, a round table and I hope to be able to capture that for you and post the audio recording, maybe even spherical view. So uh, thanks for listening and uh, 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 thank you for all of those people that have made this possible. Cheers.